here today in the Lord's house, and uh, we're going to begin our time focusing on a verse of scripture and spend some time praying and preparing our hearts. I think we have a scripture. There we go, Psalm 32, verse 5. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. You forgave the iniquity of my sins, Selah. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and you pray and search your heart. And just prepare your heart for worship today as we gather. Let's pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing our call to worship, holy, holy, holy. Oh. 
it's good to see everybody here today. And if you are visiting with us, there's a visitor's card in your bulletin that you can tear off and fill out. And there's a box in the foyer when you leave today that has, says visitors. And we'd love to have a record if you visit or if you have any prayer needs you'd like to share with us. We'd be glad to join with you in praying about those things. So let me lead us in a word of prayer as we begin to worship today. Father, we come to you this Lord's Day and we thank you for the privilege and opportunity we have to gather together as your people, Lord, and corporately worship you. Lift our voices and praise to you and hear the good word of God. And I pray today, Lord, you would challenge us and change us and work in our hearts and lives. And we know, God, there's power in your word. And I pray, God, today as we think about prayer and how important that is in our lives, Lord, that you'd really challenge us and stretch us and grow us in that area in our lives. And Prayer is such a wonderful privilege, and we thank you for that, Lord, that we can come to you and know that you hear us, you answer our prayers. And Father, we bring our needs to you this day, Lord, as a church family. I pray for those that are sick and unable to be here, and I pray, God, you would bring healing where healing is needed, and help people, Lord, to put their trust and hope in you, Lord, and know, God, that you've got a plan and purpose in all things, even our sufferings. Lord, are designed to turn us toward you and to grow us and to challenge us and change us. And so, Lord, I pray you'd help us to see you in the midst of our trials and difficulties. And may we submit uh, to you, Lord, and may you grow us and have your perfect will and way in our lives. And I pray for those that are grieving over loss of loved ones. And we pray, God, you'd bring comfort there. And, Father, we just uh, cast all our cares on you because we know you care for us. And I just pray, Lord, that you'd meet each need in our congregation. So, God, just lead us, guide us, direct us. May all that takes place this day bring glory and honor to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. And all God's people say it. Amen. Would you stand again as we sing? I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. Faster. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your good it's running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. 
Your goodness is running after, is running after me. With my life laid down and surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness.
slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Amen. You may be seated. Psalm 150 says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You made the starry host. You traced the mountain peaks. You paint the evening skies with wonder. The earth, it is your throne, from desert to the sea, all nature testifies your splendor. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, sing his greatness, all creation, praise the Lord. Raise your voice, your heights and all you depths, from furthest east to west. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You reached into the dust, with love your spirit breathed, you formed us in your very likeness to know your wondrous works to tell your mighty deeds to join the everlasting chorus praise the lord praise the lord sing his greatness all creation praise the lord raise your voice your heights and all you depths from furthest east to west let everything that has breath praise the lord Let 
Let symphonies resound, let drums and choirs ring out, all heaven hear the sound of worship. Let every nation bring its honors to the King, a roar of harmonies, eternal praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, sing His greatness, all creation. Praise the Lord, raise your voice, you heights and all you depths, from furthest east to west, you distant burning stars, all creatures great and far, from sky to sea to shore, sing out forevermore. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Well, if you have a copy of God's Word, if you'd take your Bible and stand and turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 4. We're going to read verse 9 and 10. 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. The Bible says, Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, and enlarge my territories, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated.
Well, I'm so thankful to God. We are so blessed at Pleasant Valley. I'm so thankful for Brother Sam and the choir and all the musicians and the hard work they put in, man. There's a lot of effort and energy and practice that goes into what they do each Sunday, and I'm so grateful and thankful for what Brother Sam does, the leadership he gives, and all of the musicians in the choir. They are a blessing, amen to our church as we come in to worship each week. It's a blessing. Well, today we're taking a little break from Hebrews. We've been preaching through the book of Hebrews, but we're going to preach a couple of messages, uh, various messages, and then we're going to do some seasonal things on Sunday morning coming up with Thanksgiving and then Christmas right upon us. Can you believe Christmas is almost here? (laughs) And Thanksgiving, it's amazing how time goes by. But today I want to share with you a message entitled The Prayer We All Need to Pray. A Prayer We All Need to Pray. And this text, I preached on it before, you know, throughout my ministry. And I even used this text at the church renewal that I preached in Rochelle Uh, They gave me the opportunity, uh, Bob did, to uh, share with their men uh, in the noon on Saturday. And I kind of shared this text with those men. And even after we had our prayer renewal weekend uh, just a few months back, the Lord really kind of impressed on my heart that I needed to share this message with our church. And uh, so I'm sharing it today. But let's read the text one more time. We've read it once, but let's look at it again. In in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that I might not cause pain. So God granted what he requested. You know, in our spiritual lives, we should strive to reach new heights in our relationship to Jesus Christ. And we know the term sanctification, and sanctification is the process, it's progressive, where we grow more and more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. And as believers, we need to be striving in our life of prayer. Why? You say, well, why do I need to be striving in there in my life, the life of prayer? Because you need God, and you need His help, and you need His to accomplish His will for your life. We live in very challenging times. We live in dangerous times. Our world is a mess. I mean, you know, things are just going awry and we look at the news or listen and it's just, we shake our heads in amazement. And so today I want to focus on about this person named Jabez and a prayer that he prayed to the Lord. And this is a prayer we all need to pray in our lives. Now, this prayer is a great prayer, and prayer is one of the most important areas in our lives as believers. Prayer is our fellowship with God. And really, I want you to think about it because prayer is the heart and soul of every successful relationship with God. And it's God's will for every believer to experience a powerful prayer life. Now the scripture has much to say about prayer and there's been volumes of books written on the subject of prayer but the key to success in a church in your home and in your Christian life the key that unlocks the door is prayer. Prayer. Far more than just meeting needs. Prayer is God's primary means of our coming to know Him, to worship Him, and to experience transformation through the indwelling Christ. Now, significant daily prayer is absolutely key for building a dynamic, intimate relationship (laughs) with God. Because prayer is not primarily what we can get out of God, but what He purposes to do in us and through us for his glory, and for his good pleasures. And so above everything else, God desires a close relationship with you 
each one of his children. And through prayer, God purposes to establish and deepen your relationship with him. No one's relationship with Christ will ever rise above their level of praying. If you don't pray, you don't have a relationship with God. If your prayer life is inconsistent and weak, I can guarantee you this. If it's inconsistent and weak, your relationship with God is inconsistent and weak. And it's up and down and in and out. You see, you say... And I've said this many times, even here at this church, people say, well, I have a relationship with God. Okay, let's test that. How much time do you spend in his word listening to God and how much time do you spend praying, talking to God? Because guys, that is your relationship with God. Time in the word and time in prayer, that is your relationship with God. And if you tell me, well, I'm not in the word very much and I don't pray that much, then I can tell you this, then you don't have much of a relationship with God. And it might even be that you have no relationship with God. You might be lost and might be deceived and might not even know the Lord as your savior. But you know what? There's power in prayer. Power, an untapped resource. Once a person asked C.H. Spurgeon where his power lay because he was such a powerful man of God and such a powerful preacher and God blessed his church over in London, England, the tabernacle. And the man said, well, Spurgeon, it must lay in your ability or it must lay in your education or your great mind. And Spurgeon told him, I tell you what, I want you to come to the next service. And at the Tabernacle Church, and he said, I'm going to show you where my power lays. And so the next service, the man came, and Spurgeon took him just before the surface, underneath, into the basement of the Tabernacle. And there, Spurgeon pointed, and there were a hundred men, a hundred men on their face, praying for him as Spurgeon preached and led the service, and Spurgeon said, I'll tell you, sir, this is where the power lay, right here. You see, the scripture tells us that we have not because we ask not. Jesus' disciples asked him to teach them to pray. And in the Gospels, we see Jesus in his earthly ministry praying on many occasions. Sometimes Jesus spent all night in prayer, praying to his Father to receive enablement and help for the ministry that God had for him. You see, a man will do stuff in the Lord's work for hours. We're bad about this. We'll do, 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 but spend very little time in prayer. We'll spend hours doing and minutes praying. And I'm telling you, that is not where the power lies. It's not in our ability. We engage in service a lot of times, but a small amount of prayer. Dr. A.C. Dixon said, when we rely upon education, we get what education can do. When we rely on organization, we get in on what organization can do. When we rely on eloquence, we get what eloquence can do. Not undermining any of those things, but here's what he said. But when we really rely on prayer, we get in on what God can do. And that's the key. Billy Sunday, the great evangelist, said, if you are a stranger to prayer, you are a stranger to power. I don't know about you, but I want to get in on what God can do. <laughs> I don't want to get in on what I can do. You know what? Because we're so limited, we're so frail, <laughs> we're so weak, we're so faithless. And so I want us to look at this prayer of Jabez, and I hope that each one of us will make this our Prayer. Notice number one on your outline. I want you to see the throne of grace that Jabez went to. The throne of grace that Jabez went to. Verse 10 says, Jabez called on God, on the God of Israel saying, verse 10. Now, prayer is a wonderful act because we have direct access to the throne room of God. Jabez called on God. 
the God of Israel. He didn't have to go through a priest. He didn't have to go through a monk. He didn't have to go through a preacher. He prayed and he went directly into the access of God. And what a privilege that we have to talk to God personally as one of his children. You know, the priesthood of the believer is a very precious doctrine that we hold to as Protestants and as Baptists. And uh, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 9, this verse teaches that we are priests. He said, but you are a chosen generation, a royal what? Priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, on Halloween, it was also uh, a day that kind of launched the Protestant Reformation. And there were a lot of people who put things online about uh, October 31st being Reformation Day. And Martin Luther was the leader in the Protestant Reformation. And he's often linked with the doctrine of the priesthood of the believer. Because Luther challenged the Roman Catholic Church, their emphasis on the special role that was played by the Roman Catholic priest. And so Luther insisted that every believer was a priest and that you didn't have to go through a man or through a priest. Now, he didn't call for the elimination of the role of priest or pastors, but indicated that all persons, not just pastors, had priestly function. Even before Luther burst on the European scene, various Christian groups had stressed the priesthood of the believer. And so the concept of the priesthood of the believer, it's not a Baptist thing and it's not a Luther thing. I'll tell you what it is, it's a New Testament thing. <laughs> it's a biblical thing. And so on the basis of various New Testament passages, Baptists have insisted that every person who repents of their sin and by faith trusts Christ has direct access to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And each is directly responsible to God. Uh, you know, we've been preaching through Hebrews and some of these verses came to my mind as I was kind of looking at this message again. In Hebrews chapter four and verse 13, look at this verse. It said, and there is no creature hidden from his sight but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him who must give an account. Now I want you to think about it. That's sobering words. Let me read it again. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. You know what that simply saying is? God knows everything. And he knows you. He knows everything about you. But right after he says that in Hebrews 4, 16, he says this. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Huh. Now I don't know about you, but when I read that God knows everything about me, every detail of my life, every single thing, is laid open before him, I might think, well, I can never pray again because he knows everything about me. He knows all of my hypocrisies. He knows all of my hidden sins. He knows how my heart is really is. He knows all of my failures. How could I ever come to God? But yet, the verse says, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Now, I've said this before, but I'm sure there's some here that have never heard me state this, but what if, and this is always, to me, a very convicting thing when we think about it, what if I could play a movie? I mean, up on the screen of every one of you and your life over the past six months, and I started over here with Joe, and I went to every person. I said, okay, first up's Joe Shear. We're gonna play Joe's everything he's thought, everything he's said, everything he's done, even the secret things of his heart that nobody knows, we're gonna play it for everybody to see. Every sin that has been committed, every sin that you would have gotten away with if you thought you could have, and we played it. And we started and we played everyone. You know what? 
I think most of us would probably run out of the building and cover our head in shame and probably would never want to be seen by anybody else ever again. I mean, the very things we thought this very day, what you thought about that person sitting across the room here, And you say, man, I'm glad that that is not in existence. But can I say this? God has that movie. Does he not? Oh, you can't hide from God. God knows you. He knows everything about you. He knows the secret things of your heart. He knows everything. Yet, even though God knows who we are, He tells us to come boldly to the throne of grace. How can that be? Because we have one of our own human race seated at the right hand of God. The Lord Jesus Christ, who became a man, is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he knows our weaknesses. He knows our temptations. He knows our struggles. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. That is why we see the word therefore, because we have one who identified with us yet without sin, and we can come to him. You know, you think about it, in the Levitical system that was in place up to the time of Christ, coming only, I mean, the high priests were the only ones permitted to go into the sanctuary, into God's presence, and then it was only once a year, and it was the high priest. He could enter in to the holies of holies, and when he passed from sight into the holies of holies, the people were excluded from the divine presence because of their sinfulness and prohibited from drawing near to God. You know why? Because God is holy and they were not. God is holy. We sung it today. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But the atonement affected by Christ's sacrifice of himself on the cross, it opened the way that had been closed. Jesus Christ's righteousness is applied to sinners who repent and believe the gospel and we are justified in his sight and then we are partakers of his holiness. You remember when Jesus died on the cross, the bell in the temple was ripped from top to bottom right at the time of the crucifixion indicating that through the act of divine grace, love and mercy accessed in the holiest place and it was now available to all the people of God because that bell was ripped from top to bottom and now we could enter in all because of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice upon the cross. You know that verse says we're to enter boldly. That word means confidently. Literally, all speech or speaking all things. It conveys the idea that we're free to say all things. I like the way Phillips translates the verse. He said, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with fullest confidence that we may receive mercy for our failings and grace to help in the hour of need. Isn't that great? What a blessing. Wearsby had a great comment about this. He said, quote, when you are free to speak, then there is no fear. You have confidence. A believer can come with boldness. Same word as confidence to the throne of grace with openness and freedom and not be afraid. We have this boldness because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we should not cast away our confidence no matter what the circumstance might be. We should not have confidence in ourselves because we are too prone to fail, but we should have confidence in Jesus Christ who never fails. End of quote. You can only approach this throne through Jesus Christ and Him alone. You can only come through the one and only way. You know what Jesus said? No one comes into the Father except through me. You cannot get to God without Jesus Christ. And you know, when we approach this throne of grace, and this is the throne of grace that Jabez went to, and I'm kind of fleshing that out, but notice say on your outline, when we come to that throne of grace, there is a power supplied. A power supplied. It's a throne. A throne because God is sovereign. 
Those enthroned during the days of old held absolute sway over the issues of life and death. Earthly kings possess great power, but all their power combined is nothing compared to the Lord Jesus. You think about it, the powerful God of all, we are encouraged to approach with confidence. You say, well, what kind of power are we talking about, David? Well, let me tell you. We, he has exceeding power. Ephesians 3.20, now to him is able to do what? Exceedingly abundantly, above all we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. He's got exceeding power. He's got need meeting power. Philippians 4 and verse 19, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and amen. He's got exceeding power. He's got need meeting power. He's got cleansing power. Amen? First John chapter one, verse seven. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Another thing, he's got load lifting power. Load lifting power. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he said, come to me, all you who are laboring and heavy laden, and I will give you what? He has mountain moving power. Matthew 21, 21, so Jesus answered and said to them, but surely I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mount, be removed and cast into the sea, it will be done. Mountain moving power. I'll tell you this, he's got all power. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them and saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That's power. Isn't that awesome? We have all that power at our disposal. Exceeding power, need meeting power, cleansing power, load lifting power, mountain moving power. He has all power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, this is the throne that we approach when we come to God in prayer. We have power available to us. He hears and answers our prayer. But not only power supplied, but notice grace supplied. Notice it's a throne not of judgment, but it's a throne of grace. Let us come boldly to the throne of what? Grace. For sinners, it's a throne of judgment, but for believers, it's a throne of grace. We do not receive there what we deserve, but what we don't deserve. And that's truly amazing grace. As a throne, this is the sphere of divine power. As a throne of grace, it abounds in divine favor and divine initiative toward the weak and undeserving. Grace refers to undeserved favor in freely forgiving our sins. We actually deserve God's judgment. We deserve God's judgment. We deserve hell. We deserve separation from God. But God is gracious. God's gracious to us. Grace is the free, spontaneous, absolute loving kindness of God toward men. And when you sin, you come to the throne and there is abounding, amazing supply of grace. It's a throne of grace. This is the throne that Jabez went to. And then there's mercy supplied. Mercy has a special reference to God's tender tenderness towards us. Hebert defines mercy as this, the self-moved, self-spontaneous loving kindness of God which causes him to deal in compassion and tender affections with the miserable and distressed. And you know, the text in Hebrew says, we should come in time of need. Right? It says, come boldly to the throne of grace when we're in time of need. And you say, well, when is that? Well, I don't know about you, but for me, that's all the time. That's all the time. Needy. You see, a man... Reason we don't pray, the main reason we don't pray is we don't realize how needy we are. We think we can handle things on our own. Oh, we just call on the Lord when things really get intense, really get bad. And then we're like, oh, pray, please pray for me. Pray, I'm praying, I'm asking God. No, 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 we're needy people. And during those times, 
of need, which is often we come to him. But I'm so thankful today that God is gracious and God is merciful and there is power supplied. What a wonderful promise that is when we have a trouble, a problem, a worry, a hurt. Coming up, we can take it to the Lord in prayer. We can come boldly to the throne of grace because of our relationship through Jesus Christ and his word. You see, Jesus makes it possible for us to pray. And that throne of grace is wonderful because God hears us and will give us that mercy and grace when we need it in our lives. And so when you're faced, friend, with trials and bitter providences and hardships and death and burdens, you've got an advocate with your heavenly Father. Thank God when those times come, we can approach his throne boldly. I love what Jeremiah 33.3 says. Jeremiah 33.3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great mighty things which you do not know. Hey, you can call to God. A man one day was talking to his family doctor and he said, Doc, I think my wife's going deaf. And the doctor said, well, here's something you can try on her to test her here. And he said, just stand a distance away and ask her a question. And if she doesn't answer, move a little closer and ask it again. And keep repeating the answer, repeating this until she answers. And then you'll be able to find out just how hard of hearing your wife really is. And so the man thought, well, hey, this is great. So he goes home and he tries it out. And he walks in the door and says, honey, what's for dinner? He doesn't hear an answer. So he moves a little bit closer to her and he goes, Honey, what's for dinner? No answer. He's like, man, this is not good. He repeats this several times until he's just standing a few feet away from her. And he says, you know, Honey, what's for dinner? And she says, for the sixth time, (laughs) meatloaf. Well, can I tell you this? God is not hard of hearing. What does it say? Call to me. I will answer you. (laughs) You know, it didn't say might, it didn't say maybe. It says I will. I will answer you. And I'll show you great mighty things which you do not know. You know, I've heard people say through years as a pastor, they'll go, well, I don't really know how to pray. I don't know what to say. And Listen, prayer is a conversation with God. You just talk to God. I read this story about a little boy who was saved in a native land and he had just learned the alphabet of his language and he was seen one Sunday morning on a hillside with his hands clasped and his head bowed and he's just repeating the letters of his alphabet. And the missionary drew near and he said, what's going on? And the little boy said, well, I'm praying. And he said, but why are you quoting the alphabet? He said, the little boy said, well, I I felt I must pray, but I know no prayers. And so I just said the letters of the alphabet knowing that our great God would just put the letters together. That's what prayer is. It's a conversation with God. You just talk to God. I believe that kind of prayer warms the heart of God, but Jabez, the guy in our text, knew God, and he approached the throne to present a petition. Ephesians 6, 18, praying always with all prayers and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, pray without ceasing. And then, James 5, 16, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You see, the scripture commands us to pray. And if you are not praying, I can tell you this, you are not in fellowship with God. You hear me? If you're not praying, you're not in fellowship with God. If you're not praying, then you need to do business with God today because God's ringing your bell. God is concerned about every area of our lives. 
How many times do we take matters into our own hands and we never pray and we never seek God and the result is we make carnal, fleshly decisions in our lives and we do things that are not according to the word of God and the will of God. Why? Because we're not praying. We're not in his word. We're, we don't have the mind of God, the heart of God. But God is concerned about even the little things in our lives. Everything we do, every decision we make, everywhere we go, ought to be bathed in prayer. We ought to pray. What if I applied your present prayer life to your relationship to your mate? Or your boss? How often would you speak to them? How well would you know them? Would it be like, well... I talk to my wife, I say a few words, just a few sentences at breakfast, lunch, and supper. And I do just a few minutes in the morning on the way to work. What kind of relationship do you think you'd have with your wife or your husband? You see, what if we apply your prayer life to another relationship? Would there be a relationship? Billy Graham said prayer is simply a two-way conversation between you and God. And it is two ways. But Jabez approached the throne of grace and so should we. And he presents his petition. I want to see what he prayed for, okay? So it says, and Jabez called on the God of Israel. But notice number two on your outline, and we'll go through these rather quickly, but Jabez prayed for growth. <clears throat> What did he say? He said, oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. So here Jabez begins his prayer with fervency and sincerity. And what does he say? Bless me indeed. You see, we need to be sincere in our hearts when we seek the Lord. I'll tell you what we need. We need some humility. Some seem to order God around. It always amazes me. They're going to tell God what to do. God, you do it. No, you come humbly. There are false teachers today that tell you to order God around. It makes me mad. Wrong approach in order to order God around, but we need humility and how we should begin our prayer with sincerity. And what did he pray? He prayed for growth in every area of his life. What does he say? He says, enlarge my territory. You know, if something's healthy, it's growing. If it's not growing, then something's wrong. Well, what if we could put your spiritual life in a pot today and look at it six months from now? What would it look like? What would your spiritual life look like? Would it be green and flourishing and growing and healthy or would it just be stunted and sickly, dry, dead? It's sad when you see Christians that go through their lives and there's no growth. They're the same year after year. They might be faithful to church and they may attend, but they're the same. They don't really change. Friend, listen, that is not God's plan for your life. God wants you to be growing. God wants you to be knowing more about him and, and expanding. We need to pray for growth, just like Jab is. You should want to grow. We need our spiritual territory enlarged. We need to know him better this year than we did last year. We need to know more of his word. We need to go deeper in fellowship and in prayer and love him more. I'll tell you why so many churches are in turmoil. They're in so many places. I'll tell you why they're in turmoil. You know why? Because it's filled with a bunch of spiritual babies. Hello? A spiritual baby, a bunch of immature people that are not growing in their relationship to God. And so it's all about them. It's all about what they want. It's all about what they see. And they want control and they know all they want to know. They want it their way or no way, and they don't want to grow. The Bible says that we are to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we want our church to grow here at Pleasant Valley, I'll tell you how it's going to happen. You've got to grow. Until you start growing in your life spiritually, then the church won't grow. Why? Because God's got to do work in your heart and in your life in order for us to go reach our community with the gospel. And when you grow, I'll tell you what, friend, when you're growing, you're excited about the work of God. You begin to open your eyes. You begin to see the need and exercise your spiritual gift. You're not worried about what you want, but you're concerned about what he wants. 
How many times have y'all heard me say this? It's not about me, but it's all about him. It's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. It's about advancing his kingdom. It's about Jesus getting glory. And so Jabez prayed for growth. He said, enlarge my territories. May we pray that prayer today. Jabez prayed for earthly goods. Many of the promises to the Jews were of this nature, and it's not wrong for us to pray for that. Friend, I mean, we pray for a roof over our head and food and a good job and possessions and we need to take care of our families, but we need to remember this. The Bible says that my God shall supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. I've said many times, through the years in finance committee meetings, they would always say, what are we going to do? You know, we don't have enough money or whatever, and I'd say, God's going to have to sell a cow. And they'd look at me like, what are you talking about? I said, well, the Bible says he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. God's just going to have to sell a cow to meet the need. Hey, God's able, isn't he? Spiritually, physically, materially, materially, God will work in his time to meet our needs. God will bless you and enlarge your territories if you pray fervently and believe God. Believe. Don't be filled with doubt. Can I ask you this today? Do you need your territory enlarged? You say, man, I need to grow. I need to grow spiritually. I need to grow in my knowledge of God. I need to grow in area. Well, then pray the prayer that Jabez prayed. This is a prayer we all need to pray. Enlarge my territories. Notice number three, Jabez prayed for guidance. <coughs> he said that your hand would be with me. Now, he knew that he was weak. And he needed help in his decisions. Guys, listen, we can't make it on our own. We need God's help. We can do a lot on our own, but I tell you what, when we do it on our own, we get in a mess. God can do a much better job than we can. We, we should pray for guidance, that God would guide our church, guide our homes, guide our work, guide our steps, guide our talk, guide our ears, guide our bodies, all we endeavor to do, we need God's guidance. I love this verse, uh, Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. You know these verses. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. In our lives, there are times we don't know what to do. We don't know where to turn. We don't know where to go. But if the hand of God is there to guide us and lead us, we will not go wrong. You know what? God is responsible for you because you're his child. We try to depend on ourselves without any thought of God and we get in a mess. D.L. Moody said, spread out your petitions before God, then say, thy will not mine be done. The sweetest lessons I've learned in God's school is to let the Lord choose for me. <laughs> hey, man, I'm telling you, that is it in this life. I mean, even in our personal life, but I tell you, in the life of our church, we need to pray for guidance, don't we? God, guide your pastors, deacons, teachers, the music, Brother Sam, finances, Sunday school, outreach. Do you pray for those things? I tell you, a lot of times we pray for a lot of health things, but we don't pray a lot of kingdom praying. We don't pray that God would advance his kingdom and pray for the ministries of our church. We will be praying for growth in our lives personally and for our church and guidance in our lives. I tell you what, God will guide us if we ask him to. Notice the fourth thing. Jabez prayed for a guard. And I could, we could spend a lot of time on all of these, but he said, and that you would keep me from evil and that I may not cause pain. Now, Jabez knew his weakness and the dangers of the flesh, the world, and the devil, and he wanted God to be with him and keep him from sin. Jabez didn't pray, Lord, keep me from suffering. He didn't say, Lord, keep me from, from difficulty, but he said, keep me from evil. What did the Lord pray in the Lord's Prayer? Deliver us from evil. The devil wants you to fall. He wants you out of church. He wants you to lose your testimony. He wants you to fall into his traps. You don't ever need to underestimate the power of the devil. He wants you to think you're too strong to fall, but the Bible says take heed lest you fall. Don't let pride take you down. 
I mean, if you're not doing anything for the Lord and you're stagnant in your walk and you're not making an impact for the kingdom, the devil's not going to really bother you that much. Somebody says, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand. I don't see the devil after me. Well, maybe you're not doing anything for the kingdom and that's why. Oh, leave that one alone. They're doing just fine. They're stagnant and they're not doing anything to advance my kingdom. Leave that one be. Is that you today? But I tell you what, friend, when you start shaking the the gates of hell and you begin to work and the Lord begins to move, the devil's like, hey, now, we can't put up with that one right there. We got to bring some discouragement. We We got to come after that one. The devil already has a plan, temptation. He knows us. He knows how to get us discouraged. He wants us to so discard. He wants us to quit. I tell you what, he's tried to destroy this church, has he not, through the years? He don't want this church here, and he's tried to take it down. He's tried to split it. He's tried to tear it up. Thank God we're still here, but I'm telling you, if we're not awake and alert and ready and be on guard and be growing and let God guide us, we'll get in trouble again. R.A. Torrey said this, the reason why many fail in battle is because they wait until the hour of battle. The reason why others succeed is because they have gained their victory on their knees long before the battle came. Anticipate your battles, fight them on your knees before temptation comes and you will always have victory. You see, friend, you've got to get ahead of it. You've got to get ahead of it. Notice what Jabez said. He said that I may not cause pain. You know why? Because, listen to me, sin brings pain. It brings loss. It brings hurt. You know, you might be here today and you might be contemplating, you know, doing some great sin, leaving your wife, leaving your husband, committing some affair. I don't know where you're at today, and don't think that don't happen. It does. And you might be here, you might listen to this, and you're contemplating that. Listen, I'm going to tell you, sin causes pain and destruction. But you see here, we need to pray for a guard. We need to pray for a guide. We need to pray for growth. Lord, help me to grow in your words and be faithful to my church and guide me in my decisions. Guard me from sin. Keep my mind pure. You know, there's a prayer I pray every day of my life. I pray it every day. I pray, Lord, keep me clean and keep me close in my walk with you. That's a good prayer to pray, clean and close. Clean and close to the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 3, 14 says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. A.W. Tozer said this, the church that is not jealously protected by mighty intercession and sacrificial labors will before long become the abode of every evil bird and the hiding place for unsuspected corruption. The creeping wilderness will soon take over that church that trusts in its own strength and forgets to watch and pray. Church, watch and pray. Watch and pray. And then the last thing I want us to see is God granted Jabez his request. This is number five on your outline. It says, so God granted what he requested. God answered him, granted his request. When you pray, God hears you, and the answer came to Jabez. I thought about what the Bible says. His ear is not too heavy that it cannot hear. God will do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. If you pray for growth, if you pray for a guard, if you pray for a guide, and you pray God to protect you, guess what? God will hear you, and he will answer that request. He will give you the desires of your heart. The Bible said, ask anything according to his will, and he will do it. Tozer once again said this, you can have this confidence in God that you can have this respect for his will. Do not expect God to perform miracles for you so you can write books about them. Do not ever be caught asking God to send you toys like that to play around with. Now listen to what he said. But if you're in trouble and concerned about your situation and willing to be honest with God, you can have confidence in him. 
You can go to him in the merits of his son, claiming his promises, and he will not let you down. God will help you, and you will find the way of deliverance. And then Tozer said this, God will move heaven and earth for you if you trust him. Somebody needs to hear that today. God will move heaven and earth for you if you will trust him. Can I ask you this? How's your prayer life today? Now, God granted Jabez his request, but here's the thing. I want to close on this note. But you know what? If you regard sin in your heart, if you got sin in your life, God won't hear your prayer. Look at Psalms, and we'll close on this note. Psalm 66, verse 16 through 20. What does it say? Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. But certainly God has heard me. He has attended the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer nor his mercy from me. Look, man, if you regard iniquity in your heart, God's not going to hear you. So what have we seen today? Well, Jabez, the throne of grace that he went to, Jabez prayed for growth. He prayed for guidance. He prayed for a guard. And then God granted Jabez his request. May God bless his word today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this reminder today on prayer and the power of prayer. And I pray, God, we would all examine our hearts and see where we are in this area in our lives. And Lord, this is a prayer we all need to pray, the prayer that Jabez prayed, that you would guard us, guide us, and help us, direct us. And Father, Grant our request in Jesus' name. Amen. A stand as we sing today. If you need to come today, the altar is open.